Well, welcome to Chicago Health Television. I'm here with four people who have just given a seminar called The Inside, Insider Secrets to Government Corruption. And Chip Tatum is one of the people. Welcome to the show. Also, Ted Gunderson, welcome to the show. Bryce Taylor, welcome. And Barbara Hartwell, welcome to the show. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, we'll, I'm going to just ask direct the questions to uh, each and every one of you. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about what you were doing and what the purpose of the seminar was. So uh, many of our viewers and listeners have not really had exposure or especially detailed information about what we're doing. So if you could just simply generalize and tell us what's going on uh, with the insider corruption. Who'd like to start? You want me to start? All right. <laughs> Why me? First, first, first tell us a little bit about you. Well, I was uh, in the FBI for 27 and a half years. And at the time of my retirement in 1979, I was the senior special agent in charge of the FBI Los Angeles office. I had over 700 people under my command. Uh, we had, uh, for jurisdiction, most of Southern California, over 14 million people within the area over which we had jurisdiction. And um, let's see, I was a honored as the Outstanding Law Enforcement Officer of the Year in 1977 by the AFL-CIO Metal Trades Union in Los Angeles. Uh, I was asked by Attorney General Griffin Bell when I retired to coordinate security for the Pan American Games. I worked as a consultant for the 84 Olympics, and I was a consultant to the California Narcotic Authority when Governor Brown, Jerry Brown, was governor. Well, you certainly had a lot of experience, haven't you? Well, yeah, I probably overdid it, but uh, <laughs> as far as my introduction is concerned, but I figured I'd throw in the kitchen no, sink. No, that's important. Well, it's important to establish credibility. Exactly. And I have credibility in spite of the fact that many people would like to say I don't have credibility because so, since shortly after I retired, uh, you know, I developed information personally about just extensive corruption in the government, uh, not only at the federal level, but all the way down to the city and state level across this country. And, uh, you know, I have the documentation, I have the uh, research, and I have the personal knowledge, and I have personally investigated uh, many of these uh, situations. That's basically an overview. Well, when you say corruption, there's a specific kind of corruption you're talking about that you focus on. Isn't that true? Uh, no, really, corruption is uh, pretty all-inclusive. Of uh, uh, I have information about corrupt judges, corrupt law enforcement, uh, prosecutors, um, county officials, uh, judges, and uh, it you know it re runs the gamut. It's not really specific at all, unless you. And as a matter of fact, it includes a number of areas. Uh, like for example, I have developed information in uh, Nebraska in a case I investigated in the late '80s involving international trafficking of children and kidnapping. That ties into a, a, an organization in Washington D.C. known as the Finders, which is a um, covert CIA operation. Uh, has been active since the early 1960s. I've furnished this information to authorities, the Attorney General of the United States, to the FBI. Nobody does anything about it. Now, if that isn't corruption, I don't know what is. That's ma corruption at a major level. Oh, yes. And, and what you're doing here at the Global Sciences Convention is talking about corruption that is related to um, Bryce and Barbara and uh, Chip. Isn't that so? That's true. Uh, you know, it all overlaps. It involves uh, drugs, involves pornography. Involves, involves prostitution, uh, it involves the cults, a pedophilia. Uh, there's people, as Chip will tell you, the CIA is involved in bed with uh, the mob, the mobsters, uh, and, uh, you know, the people in the White House mm -hmm. uh, that have been active in blackmailing people, <laughs> individuals, and also other uh, at other levels, not only the White House. And uh, it just basically runs a gamut. Well, isn't there some, is there some overarching or underpinning ideal or idea, some purpose behind this corruption, rather than just making a little money on the side or whatever? Isn't there? The, the bottom line is to take over the, the country and the world. For what, though? Power, greed. Uh, this goes back over 200 years, back to 1776, with the establishment of an organization known as the Illuminati. Mm -hmm. And if your listeners don't know what the Illuminati is, they need to run down to the library and look it up and do some research. Because in, uh, on May the 1st, 1776, a fellow named Adam Weishaupt, uh, German, set forth 25 goals at the request of uh, the Rothschild group uh, that they needed to uh, initiate in order to take over 
the world. We're talking about destroy the sovereignty of countries and destroy religions. And that's where it really started in modern day. And right today, uh, believe it or not, and we have the documentation for this, we are probably 90 percent, their goals have probably been filled at, at the great rate of about 90 percent. And what's happening now? Well, we have, for example, executive orders by the president. Uh, executive orders were established uh, initially to, uh, for the president to give orders to departmental heads. The presidents of the United States uh, have actually set up executive orders uh, with unlimited power uh, bypassing the Constitution, and if the, uh, and there's executive orders in place today that can take over all banking, take over all forms of transportation, take over the harbors, mm -hmm. take over air transportation, uh, take over industry, take private property away from us, and the list goes on and on and on. And also, there's an executive order in place that uh, that the president can declare martial law in the event of a national emergency. In which case, uh, we have a dictatorship. I'm not sure we don't have a dictatorship today. It's, it's uh, probably a socialist government, a uh, totalitarian government. And aren't we close to some kind of national emergency right now? Well, uh, there's a possibility of biological warfare. Uh, and uh, we just had an, uh, uh, a scare out of Las Vegas, Nevada. Mm -hmm. Anthrax scare. And, um, yes, I think there's a good possibility that could come down. Now, a fellow named Larry Wayne Harris, who was apprehended by the FBI in Nevada uh, recently, in fact, it was on February the 18th of this year, uh, they thought he had some anthrax uh, in his possession. It wasn't. It was some uh, uh, anti, not antibiotics, but uh, anti-serum mm -hmm. uh, vaccine. vaccine. Yeah, vaccine. And uh, fortunately, that was true. Uh, but at least one, th one good thing came out of that. It alerted the American people as to what the problems were and the possibilities of what could happen to us. Okay, now your seminar here tonight. I want to go on to a couple of uh, the other guests here. Uh, you summarized what you were doing here tonight, and we had, you had a three-hour seminar. And our show, is, our show is kind of short, so I'm going to move on and uh, get another piece of the puzzle here. Bryce, what about you? How about you introduce yourself? And yes, my name is Bryce Taylor, and I'm an intergenerational um, satanic ritual abuse survivor and government mind control survivor. And basically, the ritual abuse was used as a trauma-based conditioning for mind control that I was put under um, by the CIA and was programmed at military bases and at NASA centers uh, around the country in order to have... Um, my mind in mind control that was guaranteed through national security that I would never be able to remember or tell. Um, however, um, due to an accident that I had, I was able to start having flashbacks and I started remembering being um, prostituted and used in pornography um, from the time I was very young, used in child pornography. And then as I grew older, I was used by um, different presidents and governors and just I was flown in helicopters to different areas in Hollywood to be used by some of the um, people, the actors in Hollywood as well as um, being used by um, different, like I was saying, different politicians but Henry Kissinger was involved with creating a lot of my high level programming where he was able to use um, the technology that they had gleaned in all the research that was done to create in my mind what, what he called government mind files, mm -hmm. where I was programmed to have a perfect photographic memory, and I was used to, as a human tape recorder of sorts, to um, pass messages between uh, the officials and the global elitists that are planning th to um, bring in the New World Order. And that was, that was the point I was thinking of. It. All of that you were used for on the service of this New World Order. Is that right? Yes, I was. And actually, Bob Hope was, was my owner and owned also my daughter. And through that, we were used um, as, like, intelligence operatives to be sent in with specific instructions that we were programmed um, to target different individuals that they wanted to be able to enlist to work also for the New World Order. And how did you get to be owned? How, were you bought, or did Bob Hope buy you? Or? Well, there was actually, there were shows where they have, like, slave auctions where people are 
um, actually purchased. And the way I understood it was that, I mean, my parents and myself never received any money. Um, and they just, actually the CIA kind of came in, I believe, and took over a lot of people that had been satanically, ritualistically abused, knowing that that type of abuse creates multiple personality disorder and that this population could be used as a non-paid slave labor force without their own knowledge or awareness. And how rampant would you say this is? Well, I think that if you would um, look into a lot of the, the history of people that have spoken out in the past all over the country and how this has been all covered up, I think it's very rampant. And I think that there's people that have been programmed and used um, that are coming out now and speaking out. And um, I, when I speak at mental health conferences where I help um, psychiatrists and mental health professionals um, help deprogram and, and their clients, um, there's, there's a lot of people now that are coming forward naming the same people and the same agenda of the New World Order and are in need of information to help their clients deprogram. Uh-huh. And, well, <clears throat> later we'll, you'll get to s say a little bit about how some people may get some help watching our show or our listeners from you. And thanks for uh, sharing that with us. Now, next, I want to move over to Chip uh, from the Tatum Files. Is it Tatum Files? Tatum, Tatum Chronicles. Chronicles, I'm sorry, yes. Would you say, uh, you've been on our show before, and uh, would you say a little bit about yourself and how you've contributed to this sure, seminar right. tonight? Uh, for over 20 years, I was a government spy working for the Defense Intelligence Agency, the Central Intelligence Agency, and the uh, United States military intelligence uh, entities uh, in various capacities uh, throughout the world in varying positions. Uh, in the primary years, I worked in the Southeast Asia uh, environment. Uh, in in uh, the mid-70s, I, I moved into Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, Romania. Uh, in the early 80s, I went into black uh, into uh, what people know as the black helicopters flying around uh, mm -hmm. in military operations in Task Force 160, based out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky, uh, under the control of the National Security Council. Uh, from there, I went into Honduras and Nicaragua as a special operations CIA pilot flying for Ali North. Uh, and the National Security Council bringing drugs into, the, into seeing the drugs were brought into the United States, we simply brought the drugs out of the Contra camps into uh, designated areas in Honduras. They were then transferred into military and civilian aircraft and brought into the United States, dispersed to our children around the United States. Um, now, is, are those drugs, uh, this is getting off the point, but are those drugs, are they used somehow in the mind control with uh, people like Bryce and... Well, so, some of the drugs that we were producing in the Contra camps, we were we, we were not only producing cocaine in the Contra camps, but there was a small bulb, green bulb, that we would uh, produce a chemical out of. It comes from the nightshade family, and, it, and it's it's uh, nicknamed uh, Burudanga, the voodoo drug, and we would utilize that uh, in as a controlling agent uh, for most of our activities. Yes, I see. And now, how how do you you're do you corroborate the, the evidence, the, the, the things that pe the other people were saying here today about the New World Order and whatnot? Could you oh, there's say? no doubt. I sat in a meeting in 1989. Uh, my handler in the CIA uh, was Colby. Uh, I was then passed on to George Bush when he became director of the CIA. As, as a trusted ally of Mr. Bush, I sat in uh, meetings in Jupiter, Florida. Uh, we did the deeds uh, for, for these, this group of uh, of uh, New World Order participants, we actually, we, we called them uh, it, within the bounds of what where we worked, the uh, Olympic cartel, because they were dealing in not only uh, drugs, but we had, we were dealing in petroleum, foods, and people. So, uh, slavery, in other words. That's right. Okay. Well, thanks for being on the show. Having, uh, talking to you individually is one thing, but having every, all of you on one show uh, together is quite a powerful experience. Uh, Barbara. Would you say a little bit about yourself? Um, yes. Um, I was used in CIA black budget operations, um, many of them of a military nature. Um, I was a mind control victim um, in these same black budget operations, and uh, I was used as a propagandist by the CIA. 
to help bring in the new world order. I was actually a media person, I still am, radio and TV and print journalism, and uh, basically they set me up through a CIA front company to propagate um, the new world order through new age propaganda. Mm. That's about the best way I can say it. And that's, that's a comment I want to make. Um, a lot of this new age material that we see coming out today, um, it is an Illuminati ploy um, to bring in the new world order. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a diversionary tactic part of it. It's a way to get people to be complacent and under mass mind control. And that involves a lot of the trance channeling, um, all those sorts of things. Um, it's a way to sort of lull people into a false sense of security based on a false spirituality. Uh -huh. And now, Barbara, can you, uh, we're going to take a break here in a minute, but can you, will you be able to tell our viewers and our listeners how to distinguish between what seems to be the real material and what seems to be false, some disinformation on the new world? I can try. Okay. All right, good. And uh, stay with us. We'll be back in just a little while and with uh, my group from the Insider Secrets to Government Corruption. Okay, we're back, and you're watching Chicago Health Television. I'm down at the Global Sciences C Congress at um, the Seabreeze Hotel in Daytona Beach, Florida. And I'm sitting here with four people who know the insider secrets to government corruption. Now, in case you just tuned in with us, we had a, on the previous segment, everybody introduced themselves, and they talked about what has happened in their life and how they know about uh, this government corruption. So right now, we're going to talk a little bit about how once they've come out and spoken about what's happened in their life, the consequences to their life and their families, and uh, who wants to start with that? Barbara, how about you? Okay. Um, I can say that I've been under very severe harassment uh, pretty much for the past four years, since 1994. And interestingly enough, 1994 was the time at which I started to speak out, not publicly even, but just to tell people uh, some of the things that I'd been involved in. What did you start saying? Um, about what? In 1994, what did you start saying um, that, that created Okay, okay. Well, it was, it was something, I think, about breaking my programming also. Uh, but I, when I broke my programming, which means I started to remember that I had been programmed, that I was leading a double life, in essence, uh, for a number of years, many years, um, it, it's, when you break your programming, um, it's, it's very difficult. Um, now I'm getting a block. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing the block. Basically, they place blocks on you. But when you break your programming, they'll do whatever they have to do in order to make sure that they re-recruit you or they, they can stop that from happening. So if they can't stop you from remembering, they hope that they can stop you from speaking. Uh -huh. All right. And what they, some of the things that were done to me, I can tell you, they flew black helicopters over my home at rooftop level. They had surveillance vans sitting across the street from my home, uh, different ones, by the way. There was one there every day, you know, and every night, but they changed frequently. Um, I was followed. I had tails on me a lot. Uh, they sent government agents after me, posing as somebody else on numerous occasions. Uh, I had phone taps. It was like living in a fishbowl. I was also hit with exotic weapons, microwave, pulse weapons, uh, laser weapons, um, you know. And these are things that can knock you out unconscious. I've been knocked unconscious by these weapons. All right, let me interrupt for a minute. Now, Chip is a person who would know about the existence of those weapons, right? Isn't that so? You, you may have, have even used some of those weapons. I may have. Can, can we go over? <laughs> you may have. Right. I know you may have. Now, could you, could you say a little bit about that, about those weapons? I, I can say that uh, I was uh, a pilot of what they call the black helicopters. Uh, we based out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Now we're out of uh, several different areas uh, with those uh, aircraft. Uh, I can say that I flew uh, test platforms. Uh, for the government that we would drop an antenna out of the back over a mile long uh, for, for uh, to test uh, electromagnetic waves, microwaves, and so forth. Uh, uh -huh. I can say that we've tested pretty uh, darn impressive laser technology. Uh, 
here, and as a matter of fact, just recently we all heard the Air Force announce that they were going to uh, use their laser technology to blow up a, uh, a satellite in space. I believe that was in October of last year. Okay. And I, do you know personally of, of weapons that could knock people out with like, uh, a pulse beam or, or whatever it was? Are there those, those such things? Yes. Okay, so back to you. So your harassment, is it continuing today? Oh, absolutely. Um, it happens every day of my life. Every day of my life I wake up and I wonder what's coming next. The, the important thing, I think it's important, really important for people to know, is you can't let them intimidate you no matter what they do. Um, so I don't. Um, and I go through a lot of bad stuff, but I still keep talking, and um, they're not going to shut me up unless they kill me. Okay, good. Is there a possibility of that? Absolutely. Uh, I've had death threats uh, made, not, not directly to me. I certainly have had them made to my colleagues, people that I was working with, trying to disseminate this information. They've been made to people who were willing to publish my material, my written material, my research on this stuff. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely a very risky thing to do. Yeah, I'll bet. It's uh, uh, scary to be right when, uh, or when the government's wrong or something like that. Yeah, you got that right. Okay. All right. Now, who who else? Bryce, how about you? Will you say a little bit about what happened with you? Yes. Actually, in um, 1987, I began remembering um, what had happened to me in form of flashbacks, and I actually had a threat made to my life. Um, I was being tailed. My phone was being tapped, and I couldn't understand why anyone would be so interested until I started having more and more memories. But um, actually, I had to be relocated. My therapist um, was helped was instrumental in helping me be relocated to an island because um, I received in my purse a, a death book and on the island. And when I was writing the book, I was constantly harassed. Um, I, my car was totally demolished. Everybody that was helping me, their tires were slashed. And I ended up having to move from place to place to place in order to stay alive. Um, I lived in like six different states in just a very few years trying to get this book together so that I could go public and, um, and stay alive to, to help my children one day. And, um, you know, I've had the helicopters over my house, too. I've had my phone tapped. It, my phone is always tapped. And the most recent incidents that I had was um, when my office was totally destroyed by fire on January 1st of this year. Um, as I was helping other survivors and people with um, what I know as the latest brainwave technology. Um, so it just continues. And then um, if I didn't think it might have been an accidental fire, they delivered two bags of ashes to my home that was from this fire. Are you afraid for your life? Um, actually, I would say that um, that's a very large possibility. However, I'm really more afraid of living in a society where this continues to happen and where my children are being abused and everyone else's. And so I'm not afraid to die if that's what it takes. I, totally I lay agree. my life down. <clears throat> I totally agree. And I want to say something about the car stuff that she was saying. That I was spending at one point... Um, a, a average of $100 a week on car repairs. They repeatedly hit my tires, my timing belt, my radiator, my brakes. They cut my brake line. Um, and they don't want us going anywhere. They want to keep us in a, in a state of virtual, like a hostage. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually living in a motel for almost two years under unofficial house arrest and with no transportation. That's how bad it got until Ted stepped in and told me to get the hell out of there no matter what it takes. And it took him to break me out of the trance, even thinking that I could get out. Uh-huh. And Ted has been uh, your deprogrammer? No, no, no. No. No, Ted, no, Ted has been my friend, I would okay. say. And Ted is a person that has helped me out. Um, he has been following my case. He has been documenting my case. And he has made depositions so that if anything happens to me, that, he, as he says on the deposition on video, we will know why. Well, thank you. Ted was also instrumental in helping me when I was attempting to get out initially in ways to stay safe and ways of security and what to do and how to document all of my memories and send them out with safety letters so that if anything happened to me or my children, that everybody that has my material was instructed to make it more public. 
How did how did Ted initially get to both of you? Um, I was referred to Ted through a, um, a doctor, a therapist in California, Dr. Catherine Gould, who has um, been very instrumental in this whole thing of helping ritual abuse survivors mind control. And Barbara, how about you? Uh, I met Ted last August at the Global Sciences Congress, where I was a speaker for the first time in public about my situation. And Ted was also a speaker there, and um, that's how I met him. Okay. Ted, uh, how about you now? Since uh, your involvement with you were a government employee and everything, and now you're uh, investigating the government, what's happening? <laughs> uh, well, let's see. Uh, I, I really saw no signs of corruption when I was in the FBI. We had a great organization. And uh, frankly, if I had, I would have made an issue out of it. I retired, and uh, I took on a case, a uh, triple murder out of North Carolina. I don't want to go into details. We don't have time. But uh, making a long story short, I obtained a confession from one of the assailants. There were uh, seven people involved in it. And uh, this was a girl that told me that uh, the doctor, Dr. Jeffrey McDonald, was the case, did not commit those murders. They were committed by my satanic cult group. Uh, I went on uh, public television and radio, and people uh, just came out of the woodwork from all over the country, told me the same basic story. And even though I knew nothing about satanic activity, I said, you know, there's got to be something to this because these people would not, under any circumstances, be able to furnish the same information unless they were individually involved in this. So that's, that's where I first went public. And then after that, the harassment has uh, been you know, really quite, uh, well, quite intense at times. Uh -huh. Have <laughs> you had death there? Well, I've had six attempts on my life. Is that so? Yes. Uh, I've had three occasions when gunmen were after me. And... By divine intervention, I didn't go where I was supposed to go. Uh, strictly by divine intervention, believe me. And uh, I've had the other attempts on my life. Uh, the last one was in 19, spring of 1993. I was back in Nebraska investigating what we call the Franklin cover-up book, which involved uh, pedophilia, pornography, prostitution, uh, satanic cult. Uh, some of the leading businessmen in the state of Nebraska were identified by the children. Uh, Eighty children came forward. Uh, and these children, these um, uh, perpetrators have been named in a book, so you don't have to worry about a lawsuit. It's frankly, cover up by John DeCamp, Harold Anderson, past publisher of the Omaha World Herald. Bob Wadman, chief of police, Omaha, was named. Uh, Eugene Mahoney, who's head of the Nebraska Forestry Service, was named. Other leading citizens were named by these kids as being pedophiles and involved in this ring. But anyway, the last time an attempt was made on me to harm me, uh, I was driving from Omaha to Lincoln, and uh, lug nuts had been loosened on the right front wheel and the left front wheel of the car, and it came off when I was doing about 75 miles an hour. And uh, I had, I was able to control the vehicle. Uh, but uh, this is just, uh, these are the more serious attempts. Otherwise, I've had surveillances. Uh, I've had um, uh, telephone taps. And I have a way of checking to see if I have telephone taps. In fact, it did it in a very logical manner. I had an individual tell me, call me, uh, and use a certain name, a name that he never used with anybody else. And within a few days after he called me, he received a phone call at that number, his wife did, asking if so-and-so lived there. So the only place somebody could have picked it up was off telephone tap at my number, right? Exactly. And uh, so those are little techniques that I know about in order to check it out. Um, I've on the surveillances, uh, you know, I, very frankly, I've chased, I chase them out of the neighborhood. I get, you do? <laughs> <laughs> Ted, tell them how somebody canceled your plane reservations on the way here. Well, that's right. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, I had, uh, I, 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 uh, what I do, when I have a surveillance sitting outside my house, I put on the gun, of course, and I go out and I drive by about three miles an hour and just look at him. <laughs> and I do a U-turn and come back three miles an hour and look at him. Then I do that about three times, and I come in and right behind him and sit and park and look at him in the rearview mirror. And they get fidgety, and they start. I had one guy take off and run a stop sign on me. Really? <laughs> that, that, can anybody use that technique, Ted? Well, uh, not like I'm going to remember that. <laughs> well, it, it's very effective because it intimidates the hell out of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> let, 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 I've got to tell you this. <laughs> Uh, they come into my house and have been for years when I'm sleeping. Now, these guys are professional burglars, and Chip will tell you all about that. Uh -huh. and, uh, and the reason I know they're in, they come in and out uh, periodically, 
is because they leave little signs. For example, one oh, morning, that's right. calling they cards, calling CIA calling, calling, cards. calling cards. Just to harass you, scared. Oh, okay. yeah. absolutely. I had a Just pen in my house. They were there. A, a U.S. government pen. It said U.S. government skill craft. Mm -hmm. It was left on my dresser. Well, well, what, what it is, they're just letting you know they can get in your house anytime they want to. Right. And uh, what happened was one morning, or one night, I went to bed about 11 o'clock, and I had a letter that I was going to fax the first thing the next morning and left it on my desk. I got up the next morning, it was gone. And then I have uh, folders, boxes with folders in them with the labels up. Every once in a while, I'll look in there, and one of the, one of the folders is turned upside down. And they'll do it on purpose just so that you know that they've been there. Yeah, they're, they're, just to they're remind you that they know exactly what you're doing. Okay, now we're going to need to take a break. And uh, after this break, we're going to find out from Chip uh, who he thinks is, is uh, responsible for some of these, uh, the harassment. So stay with us. Okay, thanks for being with us. Uh, we have a very powerful show here tonight. And... Uh, we're returning to Chip Tatum, who's going to tell us a little bit about who's been doing the harassment. Well, you know, Ryan, uh, in the industry, whenever we get a tasking down to, and what they're talking about is a neutralization, uh, we'll normally use three techniques. We'll intimidate, uh, which is basically what they're talking about, or we'll co coerce uh, a target or surrounding individuals of that target, uh, and that's using force of some sort. Or we'll terminate them. It's all that simple. Uh -huh. um, it's hard to say exactly who it is, but it's whoever uh, whoever has something to lose. And I think uh, these ladies can probably tell us better than anyone uh, who it is that has most to lose by them coming forward. Well, you know what? What strikes me, and, and I'm thinking about some of the viewers out there, and I'm trying to talk a little bit from their perspective. People, there might be people who have never heard of any of this before. And they're going to think, you know, they may have all kinds of thoughts. But then why would our government go to such lengths as uh, harassing and telephone calls and doing some of these things? What is it? What do they have to hide? So why would they be so afraid of uh, a woman coming or any or a group of women or some people coming and saying these stories? Well, you know, the, the truth is a very powerful thing, and some can't abide by here, the, having the truth come out. Uh, the atrocities that have been done in the past that are coming out now, we read in, in uh, major media, is the, uh, the use of uh, American soldiers uh, for, for tests and uh, AIDS uh, research and, uh, I think, syphilis research. A black, uh, group of black American soldiers or black Americans were used for that. So uh, the atrocities, and men died from that. I mean, right. they physically died from that. Uh, it's no different than today. People actually die from the things that these women were used for. I'll tell you that now. Whenever we needed in the agency, if we needed a talent, if we needed someone to come in uh, that could get close to our target, uh, for example, there was one that we had in Vietnam. We needed uh, someone to get close, and uh, she actually used uh, a knife that had a like ice pick edge, and then she'd use uh, venom on the end of it. It would be placed in the base of their skull, and she just she would assassinate them while they were making love. Uh -huh. uh, you know, I wouldn't doubt that these women might be used for something like that mm -hmm. in the past. So anyone who uh, wants to come forward and expose this, especially if they're going to tell who their handlers were. There's no statute of limitations there, Ryan. Right. Those people sense. can be placed in prison for the rest of their life or receive the death penalty. I see. So that, then it makes sense. Now, uh, may I ask uh, Chip a question? Uh, Chip, uh, if you can give a direct answer to this, what agency would be involved in these type tactics? Uh, would it be special forces, i.e. CIA trained or what? Normally, it would be uh, a CIA trained, someone who has gone through that training. But, uh, you know, to say that the CIA is involved in this is very difficult because this, we don't operate as a, a single uh, intelligence entity any longer. We work on an on a international basis. We have, I've worked in, in the latter years in, with the agency. I was actually tasked, a force, tasked across to an international group uh, that comprised of uh, Danish, Danish intelligence, Turkish intelligence, U.S. intelligence, and uh, British intelligence, and uh, we we would task on from there. We would pull in talent, uh, ex Delta Force, ex Special Forces. We even used uh, Af African uh, Special Intelligence. So, you know, it really depends. I can tell you now that the the orders for a lot of what we did uh, came from uh, some 
some people associated with the G7 group of, of countries, not necessarily the United States. G7 meaning what? Well, the, the financial countries that are involved in the G7 summits. Uh, so. Okay, well, thanks. Thank you all for being on the program today. And now, if there are any viewers or listeners out there, they want to get help, maybe they've been uh, ritually abused, or maybe they're involved in a court case, or or they just need uh, to talk about something like this, what would you suggest? Who would they call? What would they do? Um, yes, Ryan, I think that people could call. Um, to In California, there's a L.A. Women's Task Force on Ritual Abuse, and I have a number where I could refer people to, and that number is area code 213-650-0807. And there's also a group in California called MASA, which is Mothers Against Sexual Abuse, and they could obtain legal defense information there. And um, I think that this number that I gave you would be probably the best source. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Ted? Um, I have a number, uh, an 888 number. I'd be glad to help if it's at all possible. I am very, very um, busy because I don't have a staff or anything. Uh, but uh, my number, my 888 number is 888-609-2916. Okay, thank you. Now, Barbara, didn't, don't you have a, a foundation you're working with? It, um, and not a foundation, exactly. I'm trying to start a fund to raise money so that we can investigate and document and legitimize um, some of these things that, that legitimize the fact that these things have happened to us. Um, I, I do have that, but there's really no phone number that I can give connected with that because at this point it's my home phone number and I really don't want to give it out. Okay, fine. So that, go ahead. Yeah, well, one, another suggestion I have is that people call my 888 number and ask for my, a copy of my research. It's important that uh, individuals are aware of what's going on, and we have the documentation. Chip has documentation. I have documentation. These ladies have documentation. It's an educational process. Uh, and I have my own radio talk show. It's on uh, in the morning from 8 to 10 on satellite. It's uh, Galaxy One, Transponder 17, 5.58 uh, audio wide band, where I'm trying to get the word out. I also have my own television talk show in Las Vegas. And what's, what station is that on and, and the time? Uh, that's on at uh, station KKJK, Channel 19, non-cable in Las Vegas, Nevada. But uh, I'm doing everything I can to educate people. And, uh, you know, we're not just a bunch of clucks sitting up here. We all have credibility. And, and we have the research. And we've been there, done that. This guy has, I have, and these two ladies. Yes, you have. And I'll, I can uh, vouch for that. Chip, you also have material available. And I know we've talked about it before. But would you say what you have and give your numbers? We do. We have a number of books available that is actually the documentation that uh, shows the corruption. You know, many people talk about uh, the government's involvements in some of these nefarious activities. We have those uh, in books that uh, part of uh, the government harassment that I receive is because I wouldn't turn those documents over to them. I didn't want them to burn out their shredders. You know, they had enough work. <laughs> so, <laughs> so those documents can be uh, obtained by calling 1-800-201-7892 and ask for extension 58. Uh, we additionally have a website, uh, and you can access our website, the Black Ops Reporter, by going to www.net, uh, scroll down the page and click on Black Ops. Uh, and if you'd like to email me, you may email me at chiptatum at aol.com. Okay, wonderful. Thanks for being on the show, all of you. And I, I applaud you for being able to come on and say these things. I, I think it's really hard. It would be hard for me, and I think it would be hard for other people out there, and, and you're courageous to go ahead and do this. And uh, it's a service that... Uh, uh, we need that uh, the country needs and uh, so stay with us um, you uh, Chicago Health Television and uh, let's uh, say that again so stay with us uh, for Chicago Health Television and uh, I'm Ryan Elliott thank you uh, I'm like <laughs> <laughs> the, I just stopped. Stopped.